But I want to start this morning talking about a banana. <laughs> when you see a banana, you see the banana peel and the general shape. What do you expect is on the inside? The fruit, a banana. What do you expect it to taste like? A banana. Wouldn't it be a shock if you opened this up and you had mashed potatoes or an orange? There's a concept in technology, and it's kind of branched out into some other uh, fields, called WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. And it started out with the idea of uh, like word processing. When you're typing in, you're typing in in a way that is the same as what you're going to get as the output. So what you see going in is what you see coming out. Um, and it has, that concept has been used a lot in other fields. What you see is what you get, meaning this has integrity. Uh, the, the input is the output. The outside is the same as the inside. And so I want to talk a little bit about that outside versus inside. In Matthew 23, I believe it's 23, hopefully I got the right. Matthew 23, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And he's not being really nice to them, actually, at this point. You know, toward the end of his ministry, he's getting more pointed and more um, forceful with his accusations. And in Matthew 23, he's actually... Um, talking about these Pharisees and these teachers of the law and, and calling them hypocrites. Does, does anyone know what a hypocrite, well, what it means and then how it's used in the Greek? Have you ever heard that? What is a hypocrite? Let's start with that. A play actor. A play actor. He knows. It's a play actor. That's exactly right. Uh, in, in the Greek cinema, <laughs> In the Greek plays, an actor would have a mask, and they would wear that mask, or sometimes they would hide behind a rock and change masks, because if you have one actor, they may play multiple parts, but they will always have a mask. And then at the end of the play, they would remove their mask so you could actually see who the real actor was. That's the root of this word, hypocrite. Um, they were play actors. And Jesus is calling these Pharisees and these, these uh, lawgivers hypocrites. You're play acting. Why? They say one thing, do it different. Because they're, yeah, they're showing a different face than who they really are. So in Matthew 23, uh, 20, Matthew 23, verse 27, here's what he says. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. They show themselves to be a banana, but on the inside they're not a banana. Okay? That's the way a lot of people are, not just the Pharisees, but even today. And that's what we're going to do. That leads us to the next beatitude. That's what we're going to talk about today. The next beatitude we see in verse 8 of Matthew 5. So if you want to flip over to Matthew 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Pure in heart really deals with the inside. We can, and, and we've talked about are hustling and bustling for things of God on the outside. You know, we can be so active doing things for the church, doing things for God, but is that really who we are on the inside? And we need to make sure that what we're doing on the outside is truly fruit that emanates from the inside. And so that's what is meant here when it says, blessed are the pure in spirit. Now, in each one of these, I've usually said there's a connection to the Old Testament. There is a connection to the Old Testament on this beatitude. And if we go back to Psalm oh, 24, hey, I got it. Psalm 24, this is a psalm of what's called Psalm of Ascent, 
when you had people, the Jews, remember they had to go to, to Jerusalem at least three times a year if they were going to be faithful to the pilgrimage, faithful to the, the, the festivals. And so there were, tra there were um, pilgrimages, there were people traveling uh, throughout the year. And when they got to Jericho, Remember we said Jericho is actually below sea level, it's way down there, and there's a 17-mile trek from Jericho all the way up to Jerusalem. And so what they would do, generally speaking, is when they hit Jericho, it was a shift in mindset. They were now going to see God. Okay? They were en route to the temple. And so they would sing psalms, and songs that got their minds prepared. Uh, I remember back uh, a number of years ago, we, would, we used to prepare our minds for communion. And so you'd sing a song, and, and we still do that some today. We'd sing a song, we'll have a, a speaker come in and say something about communion, to ready our minds. That's kind of what they did um, when they were going to, to the temple to see God. And Psalm 24 is one of those psalms that talks about that journey. Not only that, I'm going to have to blow my nose here in a sec, so um, excuse me. Um, not only that, the priests would also sing a song like this when they were going into the temple. They were ascending the temple steps. And so they would sing the same kinds of psalms because they were going to see God. So these psalms are called Psalms of Ascent. They're ascending from Jericho. They're ascending the steps of the temple. They're going in. And so if we read Psalms 24, let me flip over to it right quick. Uh, where do we want to go here? Three and four. Okay, the whole psalm is used in this psalm of ascent, but specifically let's look at Psalm, three, the, psalm 24, verse 3 and 4. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Wait a minute. Pure heart, remember? That's what, thank you. That's what we're talking about. Blessed are the pure in heart. Okay? So who can see God? Who can go uh, to the temple to see God? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. Um, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. So that's kind of the connection that we get. Jesus is reinforcing that. He's bringing that idea. Again, it's not a new idea. He's reinforcing the idea of old and saying, right, we've been talking about it for years. The kingdom is now, and this is, this is your gift. If you are this, you will see God. See God? These people were going to see God in the temple. Their intent was to journey to Jerusalem or to journey to the temple to see God. And here Jesus is saying the pure in heart will see God. Um, let's talk a moment about the word pure. The word pure technically means clean, as in clean of the influence of sin. Uh, it is also a word that is used for cleansing of leprosy. So you could talk about using it in a physical aspect as well. But in a spiritual aspect, it's talking about purging or cleansing your heart of sinful influences. One of its synonyms is uh, katharos, um, or, uh, I'm sorry, no, no, no. One of his, that's, that's the word. Katharos is the word meaning pure. One of its synonyms is eilekrines. And that word means to judge in the sun. Judge in the sun. Today we might say sincere. Their etymology, Latin people, uh, people who know Latin and people who trace the word, uh, word history would say that the word sincere actually comes from this word sincerus, it's a Latin word, and it means clean, or pure of composition, unadulterated. Where There are people, we would call it, there's a folk etymology. There is another 
storyline of this word sincere. Pure etymologists say this isn't true, but the folk etymology has been around for hundreds of years. And the, that folk etymology says this word sincere has some connection to the, the phrase without wax. Sin or sans without Sarah wax. I don't know if that's truly a connected word all the way back to the root Latin word, but it certainly makes sense that in the context uh, it makes sense. Now let me tell you the story behind without wax. The idea is stonemakers or stonemasons or, or people who um, sculpted with marble or various uh, materials, if they if there was a fault in the material, a fault in the stone or the marble, or if they happened to make a mistake, they would cover over that fault with wax. And so from certain perspectives or in certain environments, you couldn't see that that fault was there. Um, another usage was honey. People would say that their honey was sincere, without wax. So it was pure honey. You know, uh, my, my dad used to harvest honey from bees. And you had the, all of the wax that came with the honey when you harvest the honey. Well, if you strain that wax out, you have just the pure honey. So it is without wax. Sometimes in certain environments, you can't tell that the wax is in that honey. If you take that word with its literal meaning, judged in the sun, if you were to look at this sculpture or this honey in the sunlight, it might be easier to see that wax or those imperfections. And so there is an idea, whether the purest etymologists like it or not, there is this concept that seems to fit about this without wax, without, without the imperfections. They didn't cover over anything. Remember, we're talking about hypocrisy. Are you truly what you present yourself to be? So without wax, are you sincere? Are you pure in heart? It, it led me down an interesting question. This judged in the sun. I'm just going to write it. What would you look like in the sun light? Sun, play on words, Jesus. If Jesus was to shine his light on you, what would he see? Would he see those imperfections? Say again. In the sermon today, he said he sees his son. If you have, yes, if you have, if you've put on Jesus and you depend on Jesus, when God sees you, he sees Jesus. But what do we look like? If we're going to get to a point in Matthew 6, I believe it is, uh, where we talk about reflecting the sun. And when we are asked to reflect Jesus' light. In fact, Matthew 5 talks about shine your light so that others may see it and glorify God. That light doesn't, is not our light. That light is Jesus' light in us, or a reflection of Jesus' light. If other people were looking at us, and they see this reflected sunlight, would they see the imperfections? Would they see the hypocrisy that Jesus noted in the, uh, the Pharisees of the day? Something to consider. So, that takes us back to blessed are the pure in heart. Heart. We've talked about pure. What about heart? What is the heart? Life-giving portion. Okay. Yes. Biologically speaking, we're talking about the, the blood pumper. But usually when we say, I love you with all my heart, 
We're not talking about the blood pumper, are we? What are we talking about? Soul, spirit. Okay. Our spirit, our mind, our, our whole being. Uh, oftentimes in the Bible when they talk about uh, compassion and their heart, their focus or the, the locus of that compassion comes from the bowels. They feel it in their bowels. And if you talk to other people of other na nations, they might say the kidneys. Uh, it's very cultural what this heart means to people. But in this context, I would suggest that heart is similar to eyes. If you're pure in your eyes, what you look at, what you long for. Remember the story of Lot's wife? She looked back. Now, was it just a matter of her looking back, physically looking back? I don't think so. I think she was looking back with her heart. She was longing for. She was wishing for the lifestyle that she had. And so in that sense, one might say what you're looking at, what you're seeing, what you're motivated toward is your heart your attitude. And so when we talk about our desires, Matthew 6, we're going to talk about that in probably seven months, but, <laughs> but Matthew 6 talks about this when, he, when Jesus says, if your eye is, and I actually like the old, old translation, single, if your eye is single, because that word actually means folded or unfolded, if, if it's unfolded, if it's a single sheet of paper, it is undistracted, it is pure, it is focused. But then he says, but if your eye is, and our translations say dark, or bad, a lot of the old translations say, that's the idea of folded, that's the idea of being double-minded focused in two different directions. If your motives are chasing after two different things, things of God and things of the world, then the point Jesus is making is the light of Jesus does not shine brightly in you. And that's a lot of what he's getting to here in the heart. Are you pure in heart? In fact, let's... Um, Let's go to James 4, verse 8. And, and the, that Matthew 6 verse about the eyes is up on the board. So if you want to look at that, you're welcome to. But let's look at James 4, verse 8. I'm not being very animated today, am I? I'm kind of low-key. I feel low-key. <laughs> That's funny. My, my son and wife watched... Um, they're really into Marvel movies, and there's a, a bad guy called Loki. So I just, I'm low-key today. No, not a bad guy. <laughs> James 4, verse 8. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded. Double vision, folded, not single, not pure. Purify your hearts, you who are focused on two different things at one time. Purify your hearts, you who are hypocrites, who show yourself to be one thing, but are really something else on the inside. See where I'm going with that? That's kind of... the. The point Jesus is making. Purify your heart. Focus, have a single, singular focus on God, and you will see him. He's not, he's not trying to hide himself. He wants to be seen. But you have to want to see him. To see him. Seek and you will find, Jesus says. It's funny, Proverbs uh, 16.2, did I write that? I did. Proverbs 16.2 basically says, 
all of a person's ways seem pure to him. We often think that we're, we're doing what we think is right, right? But then he says, but motives are weighed by the Lord. So sometimes on the outside we seem to be pure. But God can see what's on the inside. Motives are seen by God. Questions, thoughts about pure in heart. I'm actually trying to get through these relatively quickly. I'd like to finish the Beatitudes today. But that doesn't mean don't have a question. <laughs> Feel free to ask a question if you choose. Or if you have a comment. Okay? Are you WYSIWYG? That's the point. Are you WYSIWYG? Do I present myself in a way that's truly who I am? One might say, do I have integrity? Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Verse 9. Congratulations to the peacemakers. This one can go all over the map. It's explained in a number of different ways. Congratulations to the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, the expositor's Bible commentary says this. Jesus', Jesus concern in this beatitude is not with the peaceful, but with the peacemakers. In First Night, the movie First Night, Sean Connery, Sean Connery makes a, a comment. Um, he's being goaded by the bad guy. And uh, the bad guy says, don't you want peace? And Sean Connery's character says, sometimes there's a peace that can only be had on the other side of war. And that's kind of what the uh, expositor's Bible commentary is saying. Jesus' concern is not with the peaceful but with the peacemakers. It continues, making peace is not appeasement. The true model of God's costly peacemaking is Jesus on the cross. The battle that was fought on the cross. And we could go, if we want to, to um, Colossians 1.20. Let's just look at that right quick. Colossians 1, verse 20. Through him, that is Jesus, to rec okay, let's go a verse earlier, verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that is Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. That is, make peace with all things. That the root word for, for peace here means to recon a reconciliation. Okay. Um, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So that's the idea that peace is had, peace is made through Jesus' activity on the cross. Um, peace is not ignoring issues. It's not just sweeping the issues or the problems under the rug. It's tackling the issues. And in the, in the case of Jesus, it's tackling the issue of sin. It's tackling the issue of death. Now, we each have our own peacemaking to handle because we have to accept that reconciliation that's offered. Right? And so there's a peacemaking that we have to have within ourselves. We have to make peace with God. He's already extended the hand of peace through Jesus. But it's ours to reach up and grab, okay? Um, let me ask a question. What is peacemaking to you? What does peacemaking look like? Somebody who's trying to negotiate. Yes, a, a, a mediator. Um, and sometimes not just a mediator between two parties, but if you are trying to bring peace with something else, someone else, Kind of the Matthew 18 idea. If there's a, an issue between you and your brother, you go to him and you try to make that correction. You try to make that peace. You don't sweep it under a rug. You don't make it look like everything is good. When Paul heard about um, the, 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 Corinth, the yes, Corinthian church, he had a lot of struggles with the Corinthian church. 
But when he heard about the Corinthian church, there was someone who had taken up with his dad's wife. And the church there thought they should be peacekeepers and love everybody. And so, you know, these people brought their Bibles in and they sat on the front row and they were good little followers, except their lifestyle wasn't showing it. And everyone's like, I don't know, that's, that's not really right, but we better keep the peace. Paul says, no, I've already judged them. It's a good thing I'm not there. He says, that's not the kind of thing you sweep under the rug. Just not acknowledging the problem is not making peace. Okay, so mediating or promoting peace. Okay, what else? What, how else would we define peacemaking? Okay, number one, and, and I, I'm, I'm putting together a lot of things that other scholars have said. And there's really two components. And one makes practical sense. The other makes theological sense. And I think the theological sense is really where Jesus is going on this. But let's talk about the practical first. Making peace with God, that's me and God. And we've talked about that a little bit already. God has already extended the peace through Jesus. I've got to make that peace with him and say, you know what? I am poor in spirit. I'm sorry. I want, I hunger for that righteousness. I've got to make that peace. Number two, making peace with others. Okay, and we talked a little bit about that. We could go to Matthew 18, talking about if someone has something against you, go to them. Make that peace. Don't sweep it under a rug. Um, mediating peace between others. Okay, I may not be the one at odds with other people, but I am mediating two people who are at odds. So being a party to the solution is another way that we could keep peace. Okay. Now some scholars, and I like this, this is, I think this is really where Jesus is headed. Some scholars talk about peacemaking in a messianic overtone. And we talked a little bit about that when we said Jesus has already extended the hand of peace by dying on the cross. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. Okay? And we looked in Colossians already, 19 and 20, Colossians 1, 19 and 20, where he made peace through his death on the cross. Let's go then to Isaiah 52, verse 7. Isaiah 52, verse 7. When we make peace, according to this messianic peacemaking concept, we are sharing the good news of Jesus. So that's what peacemaking means in this context. Peacemaking means bringing Jesus, the message of Jesus, to people who need him. And I like that partly because it leads us right into the next beatitude. Okay? But look at this in Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Good news? Good news of Jesus, the gospel. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. How beautiful are the people who bring the message of the gospel. The message of peace. Blessed are those who bring the message of peace. Who proclaim the good news of the gospel. And I like this idea because if you do that, the next beatitude you will be persecuted. It kind of leads into it, doesn't it? Okay? Now, I don't want to get there just yet, but I, I just wanted to show you that lead in. So I like this idea of peacemaking is really a matter of bringing the message of peace, spiritual peace, 
heavenly peace to people who need it. Um, the complete word studies, New Testament, says the one who, having received the peace of God in his own heart, brings peace to others. He is not simply one who makes peace between two parties, but one who spreads the good news of the peace of God which he has experienced. Okay. So this is a perspective that is taken commonly in the scholarly circles. And I, I tend to like it. Um, acknowledged as God's sons. Who prior to this has been acknowledged as the, the children of God? God's sons. Old Testament. The Jews, the Israelites. We could actually go back to Deuteronomy 14. And don't feel like you have to flip to all these verses if you don't want to. I'll read them. But De Deuteronomy 14, some of you have electronics that can get there faster than I can. <laughs> uh, Deuteronomy 14, verses 1 and 2. God says, you are the children of the Lord your God. Who? The Israelites. You are the children of the Lord your God. Do not cut yourselves, shave in, front of, in the front of your heads for the dead, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. We see this again throughout some of the Old Testament. So to date, um, this date when Jesus is speaking, the Israelites saw themselves as sons of God, children of God. And Jesus is, in a sense, turning the tables a little bit. It's not children of Abraham who are children of God. It is now people who make peace, who are sons of God. Now, this doesn't mean this is how you enter um, glory, unless we're talking about that messianic perspective, peacemaking, making peace through Jesus. Jesus is the reconciliation that we accept. Okay? That's how we become sons and daughters of God. But if you're a peacemaker, if you are one who brings peace to other people through Jesus, then it's kind of a, like a merit badge like a Boy Scout merit badge, okay? You're, you're proclaiming the good news. You will be called, not you are, but you will be called a son of God, okay? You're bringing that good news. If you've already made peace for yourself, then you are a son of God. Look at um, Galatians 3. Galatians 3 plays on this idea of, of you are a son of God, if you've put on Jesus, Galatians 3, 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Skip over to verse 6 of chapter 4. Because you are his sons... Okay. God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Now, we all know, I think, Abba is an Arabic word that really is um, a familiar word. It's like a, a, a young child saying, Daddy. Okay. It's that kind of a close relationship that, that God is having with us, that we have, that access that we have to God. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So the tables are turned. Here, Jesus is saying, it's not because you're children of Abraham that you are sons of God. It's because you have made peace with God through the reconciliation that's offered. What's the reconciliation offered? Jesus. Christ the Messiah. Okay. Thoughts? Concerns? Are you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> okay. What do, we, what do we do with um, Brother 
brothers and sisters in Christ who not only don't practice peacemaking, but delight in stirring it up. <laughs> broken relationships yeah. all around. Them. Right. Um, from a practical sense, we have to travel, especially if they're a brother and sister in Christ, we've got to travel the Matthew 18 route, which basically says, go to them. Try to, to show them the error. If they don't hear you, bring another and try again. Often. Now, sometimes that works. Sometimes they're like, you're right, I'm sorry, let's fix this. Sometimes that doesn't work, and people are obstinate because people are people. There is a point, and this is really church administration. If the matter is brought before the entire, if it goes far enough, in Matthew 18 it talks about going to the entire congregation. If the entire congregation has attempted and the person still will not turn, then according to what Matthew 18 says, or the way I read it, the church is to basically release them into the world and say, we can't have fellowship with you anymore. Hopefully it will never get to that because the intent is we all need communion with each other in order to pursue a Christ-like walk. And if, if I'm cut off from the church, and I'm not connected to Steve, or I'm not connected to Clay, and, and I can't lean on them as a guide or for strength, then I'm going to, in essence, die physically, or die spiritually. And we don't want that. Um, and so the hope is that by bringing it to the community, hopefully it'll never get to that point, but if it's brought to the community and the community says, look, you're not doing what you need to do. Now, the issue there is sometimes the community doesn't understand well the situation. And at some point, I, you know, I, I don't know God is his own judge, and I cannot judge for him. At some point, we do need to just let go. If it is an obvious sin, we need to make that correction. Like, like the, the man and his father's wife in Corinthians. There are some sins that if we read the Bible, we see it, and we're like, you know, th you, you can't do that. If, if there's some... Things that we can't uncover, we have to do what we think is best, knowing that we are not God's judge. Um, and, and I don't know that I have an answer for those moments. Sometimes that person will be cut off, and they shouldn't be. Sometimes that person will be let let remain, and they shouldn't be. Um, but to the extent that we are aware and able, we as a church should be able to make some of that decision. Hopefully it never gets to that point, because one or two should go first. Now, why two? You know, obviously if one goes, and we'll talk about this again when we get to Matthew 18, but if one goes and correction is made, no one else needs to know. Because the, the matter was really between the two of you. If it's not heard or not corrected, why two? Why, why does Matthew 18 say two? Witness. Witnesses. Yes, in the Jewish um, society and, and in the Old Testament laws, two is enough to condemn. But you have to have two. You can't condemn on the, on the witness of one. So if two people go and acknowledge that the attempt was made um, and the person is still obstinate about the sin, 
that's when you open it up to the broader audience. Um, so I think it's important to keep it as small as possible, if at all possible. What we have a tendency to do, actually, we have a tendency to go tell other people immediately. Well, you know what so-and-so did? Well, and then we're just as wrong as they are in other ways. Uh, and, and so I think it's really important for us, motives, you know, for us to go with good motives to that person. You know, if we go to that person with pointed finger, they're less likely to make a correction. But if we go to that person with I statements or, um, you know, here's how I felt. And man, that, you know, I, I, am I getting this right? Am I clear? Or is this, my, is my perspective, if my, is my understanding what you're presenting? Uh, because we may be the ones who are reading it wrong. Um, and, and then that gives them an opportunity to, I'm going to say save face. You know, if they see that they're wrong, but you're pointing them, you know, you're not giving them an opportunity to save face. All you're doing is, is putting them in a corner and the propensity that they have is to come out biting. Whereas if you, and, and this is a, a big um, Arabic thing actually, saving face. You give people opportunity to save face. You put them in a, a, on a ground where they could acknowledge they're wrong and still look good. And so when you go with guns blazing, fingers pointing, even though they may admit they're wrong, they don't look good. But if you allow them that grace to look good, to feel good, basically present yourself as one who's open to forgiveness rather than, by golly, you better change or else. That's not going to really help the matter. We can talk about that again when we get there, but um, I don't know. I certainly am not one who can judge like God. I think we are called, and we'll talk about this a little later in Matthew 5, we are called to judge fruit. We can't judge the roots, but we can judge the fruit. If the tree does not bear the right fruit, or does not bear fruit, we can discern that that's true. If you are being somebody who is making mashed potatoes instead of bananas, other people can see that and judge that, discern that. But it is not ours to judge whether your roots are tied into the branch of Jesus Christ. And that's a, a kind of a fine line, but we can judge the fruit. Can't take action on the roots. And I don't know how that always fits into the scenarios you're talking about, but our approach needs to be along those lines. Sometimes we'll get it right. I think sometimes we won't get it right, and thank goodness God has grace. Um, You know, I mean, you just can't come up with a new one. Shift it over to what God said rather than on you personally. Yes. None of us are good enough to be oh, yeah. good enough to judge. That's right. Yeah, and, and I think it is very important not to, not to leave it in the hands of our understanding in the judgments of the current conditions of the world. We've got to lean on Scripture, and we've got to lean on our understanding of Scripture. Now, what will be interesting is if we approach them and they say, you know, I get that, I, I hear you, but what about this? And they take you somewhere else. Now you have a Bible study. <laughs> that's, that's your opportunity to go, huh, let's, let's talk about that. I'm interested. And if you show interest, that's a hook. And that potentially will bring them back. James says, you know, if you bring someone back to, to Christ, you're, you know, good deal. And so if you're 
inviting that conversation. If they're showing um, motivation and you're inviting the conversation, even though you may know that that's really not right where they're going, use it. Start where they are and bring them back. Say, ah, that's, that's a great verse. I like that verse. What do you think, though, that it's saying when it says this? Let's talk about that in, in its practical application and then slowly reel them back in if you're able. Okay, so there, I, I guess what I'm saying is our approach can make all the difference. And I've been involved in, I don't know, church decisions that choose to put someone out that I felt they did not do it right. Um, and I've even expressed that. But one person, 50 people, can't always make the decision, you know. Um, but I think it's very important how we present ourselves. And we know that we won't always get it right. But as a corporate body who are all trying to follow this, if we're all trying to follow this, we're doing the best we can. And I think God has a way of shock therapy, if that person needs it. Or, okay, so that family isn't the right one. Let's lead this person to the right family. Um, you know, God can, God can work with us or against us, depending on how we're, we're working. And, and I'm grateful that he can. Um, I, I've got one lesson on um, being a Christian in combat boots. Uh, we, there are a lot of Christians that like to wear their combat boots, point fingers and go in guns blazing. And that's not necessarily the way to go. Sometimes it is, rarely, but we like to do that as Christians. Peacemaking. You know, the idea of peacemaking might have been a shock to the Jews. They were hoping for a warrior Messiah. They were hoping for someone who could come in a clean house. And here Jesus is talking about peacemaking? Wait a minute. I don't want that. I want the Romans gone. Flip side of that, they may have seen that line like in uh, first night sometimes there's peace that can only be had on the other side of war and went all right war's coming let's make peace depends on which way you want to look at it right but either way jesus is i think jesus is really talking about reconciliation with god spiritual reconciliation not physical peace really quickly we can well you know what I don't know that we can run through this in four minutes. And besides that, I'm thinking about next week. We have salt and light next week. Huh? Salt and light next week. Let's go ahead and stop here. Oh my goodness. Look at the clock. This is the first time I think I have ever stopped before 1130. Um, let's stop here. And, and the reason I do that is I don't necessarily want to half-heartedly start the next section. You remember I said the, the way that the Sermon on the Mount is edited, whether it was through Jesus or through Matthew, it has certain sections. And that next section actually starts in Matthew 5, verse 17. And I don't really want to get into Matthew 5, 17 next week. Um, because I'll feel like I'll half-heartedly get into it and then won't really get to complete a thought. And so what I want to try to do, and it may be a short week next week, and I know you're like, hey, that's fine with me, but I want to finish out the Beatitudes next week and then talk about salt and light and stop right before that next section. So two weeks from now, we will start the second section of narrative in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so next week, we will finish this one out. We'll do, oh, we'll talk about persecution. Oh, persecution. Only in the name of righteousness. Sometimes it's, we're persecuted because of our own stupidity. <laughs> and that might be fair. 
<laughs> he says no. <laughs> All right, let's pray. We'll be dismissed and we'll see you back uh, next week. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the sunshine today and uh, for the smile that that sun can bring to us. And, and Lord, thank you for your son and the smile that, it brings to, uh, that, that he brings to us through uh, his sacrifice and the gift of salvation that he's given to us. Lord, help us to be your sons and your daughters, your people who are excited to shine the light of your son onto other people, to make, make peace um, for other people. Help them to see that peace that can be had through your son. Help us to, to be children of pure hearts, uh, not hypocrites, but, but people who have clean hearts, unadulterated hearts that, that can be seen in the light of, of the son or your son and uh, to, see, to be seen without flaws. Lord, thank you so much for, uh, for the opportunity we have to put on your son. And uh, we know that we fail so often, but we're grateful for your son and, and the gift of your son that we can, we can be seen by you uh, as, as him, as his glory, as his light. Lord, thank you for uh, this group. Thank you for the hearts that we have, and the open minds that we have. Be with us as we uh, continue through our week. We pray this through your son's name. Amen.